Hello, this is Michael Altos. We are continuing our discussion of endocrine physiology. This is recording part two. The thyroid gland secretes thyroid hormone. It starts with thyroid releasing hormone secreted from the hypothalamus, which in turn leads to secretion of TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, from the pituitary gland. This goes to the thyroid gland and causes release of thyroid hormones, T3 and T4. These hormones then cause negative feedback and inhibit further release of TSH. If patients are hyperthyroid, often TSH levels are basically zero. That would be, of course, in primary hyperthyroidism. Secondary hyperthyroidism would be elevated TSH levels leading to elevated secretion of thyroid hormone. T4 is thyroxine and T3 is triiodothyronine. Both of these are secreted from the thyroid gland. T4 is present in much higher quantities, but T3 is much more potent. Outside of the thyroid gland, in the peripheral tissues, T4 is converted into the more potent T3. Both of these hormones contain iodine. Thyroglobulin is a protein which binds to the stored thyroid hormone. In the thyroid gland, about two to three months worth of thyroid hormone is stored. When thyroid hormone is secreted, it becomes bound to thyroid binding globulin. Thyroid hormone has a slow onset of action and a long duration of action. The graph on the right shows an injection of thyroxine, or T4, and its effect on basal metabolic rate is not at its maximum until about 10 days. And the duration of effect, as you can see, is over a month. Thyroid hormone will profoundly increase basal metabolic rate, increase the functional activity of cells throughout the body, and increase cardiac output, heart rate, and blood pressure. Hyperthyroidism may present with symptoms of increased metabolic activity. Tachycardia, hypertension, increased respiratory rate, Atrial fibrillation and heart failure may also be seen. Patients experience muscle tremors, heat intolerance, sweating and weight loss, anxiety and sleep interference. Exophthalmos or protrusion of the eyeballs can be seen, usually with autoimmune, autoimmune hyperthyroidism, like we see with Graves disease. Patients may also have a goiter, which is a bulging thyroid gland. There are many causes of hyperthyroidism. Graves disease is an autoimmune disease with antibodies that activate the TSH receptor in the thyroid gland. Toxic goiter or thyroid adenoma can lead to increased secretion of thyroid hormone and bulging of the thyroid gland in the neck. Thyrotoxicosis is the condition where there is too much exogenous thyroid hormone. The patient has taken an overdose of thyroid hormone. One example of hyperthyroidism is thyroid storm. This can be seen in patients who have Graves' disease or a hyperfunctioning thyroid nodule or a goiter or any sort of tumor that secretes thyroid stimulating hormone. The mnemonic I like to use is thyroid storm is deadly, standing for trauma, surgery, infection, and diabetic ketoacidosis. These are four of uh, the common conditions that can precipitate hyperthyroidism, uh, or specifically thyroid storm, in these patients who already have uh, hyperthyroidism. There are many other precipitating clinical events like hyperosmolar coma or hypoglycemia, many drugs, including drugs that induce anesthesia, thyroid hormone, of course, NSAIDs, adrenergic drugs, and anticholinergics, as well as withdrawal of antithyroid medications and a condition known as a molar pregnancy. Thyroid storm is really a clinical diagnosis. Uh, we notice a clinical presentation that includes hypermetabolic features, hypertension, a widened pulse pressure, and a tremor. Patients may have nausea and vomiting, fever, diaphoresis, tachycardia, and palpitations even leading to atrial fibrillation. If it's untreated, it can lead to agitation and psychosis, progressing to stupor and coma and can actually be fatal if untreated. 
due to cardiac arrhythmias, congestive heart failure, hyperthermia, and multiple organ failure. The treatment of thyroid storm is mostly supportive. That is, we maintain an airway, giving oxygen and ventilatory support if needed, resuscitation with IV fluids, correction of electrolyte abnormalities, and importantly, aggressive control of the hyperthermia with ice packs, cooling blankets, cooled IV fluids, and acetaminophen. Incidentally, aspirin should be avoided in these patients because it displaces the protein-bound thyroid hormone and actually leads to more free thyroid hormone in circulation. Patients may, all benefit, may also benefit from meperidine, which can help to prevent shivering and increased oxygen consumption. The mainstay of treatment for thyroid storm is beta-adrenergic beta blockade in order to maintain heart rate and blood pressure control. This is the first-line therapy, more important than any other endocrine treatment. Classically, the treatment was propranolol, which as we know is a beta-1 and beta-2 non-specific antagonist. The dose is one milligram given over about one minute, and you can repeat that dose every two minutes up to a total dose of 15 milligrams. Because it's beta-2 uh, as well as beta-1 selective, uh, we want to be cautious in patients who have lung disease like COPD or asthma. And as with any beta blocker, uh, we want to have caution in patients with decompensated heart failure because it is a longer acting drug. The beta-2 activity may also may actually be the cause of the hypermetabolic effects and the heat, and heat production. So the beta-2 blockade may be a very useful treatment in these patients. Propranolol also inhibits peripheral conversion of the T4 to T3 hormone, making it, once again, a very good treatment for thyroid storm. Modern uh, treatments may include esmolol, which is a shorter-acting agent, and that may be preferable, especially if you are concerned about heart failure, because the esmolol can be quickly titrated up and down. The dose would be 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilogram as a loading dose, followed by an infusion at a rate of 100 to 300 micrograms per minute. Usually, we titrate to a target heart rate of less than 100 beats per minute. Now, if you're really concerned about reactive airway disease, or if there are other contraindications to beta blockers, you could consider other supportive control to maintain heart rate and blood pressure control. Um, that might include metoprolol or atenolol, which seem to have a lower incidence of pulmonary side effects. Or you could switch to another agent altogether, like calcium channel blockers. Once you've established sympathetic control, there are some endocrinological treatments that may be appropriate. Uh, one of them would be antithyroid medications. There's propothiouracil, PTU, given as a 600 milligram oral or rectal dose, followed by redosing every four hours. Uh, this drug inhibits the synthesis of thyroid hormone, and it also inhibits the peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. The problem is it can't be administered IV, and if the patient is obtunded or unconscious, uh, they won't be able to swallow the drug, and the rectal administration is not always associated with reliable absorption. Uh, people have given it through a nasogastric tube, uh, which is another option. The IV preparations are not available in the U.S. There have been people who have crushed it and administered it through a filter, but this is obviously not a common practice. The side effects of PTU are hepatic failure, rash, allergic reaction, and agranulocytosis. And for the, this reason, mostly because of the hepatic failure and the agranulocytosis, uh, the drug is not commonly used anymore, and it's really limited to patients in their first trimester of pregnancy. The other drug, which is what you will mo more commonly see people taking, uh, both for thyroid storm and for um, chronic hyperthyroidism, is methimazole. Uh, the dose is 20 to 25 milligrams orally or rectally. Uh, similar to the, similarly to PTU, uh, it inhibits synthesis of thyroid hormone, uh, but it doesn't inhibit peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. It has a longer half-life and a slower onset. Uh, once again, can't be given IV. Uh, but it is teratogenic, so while it doesn't have the hepatic failure associated with PTU, it's not appropriate for patients in their first trimester of pregnancy. Finally, a few other treatments for thyroid storm would be steroids, like um, dexamethasone, 10 milligrams IV, or an equivalent dose of hydrocortisone, in order to reduce thyroid secretion and inhibit the T4 to T3 conversion. Patients with thyroid storm should definitely go to the ICU, and this might be a good time to call the endocrinologist even in the middle of the night um, in order to manage this patient's care.
When we care for patients with hyperthyroidism, the first concern is that the patient should be euthyroid. If they have been hyperthyroid, they need to have had adequate preoperative treatment to achieve the euthyroid state, usually with PTU or methimazole. Sympathetic medications, and these include ketamine, pancuronium, ephedrine, should be avoided. And recall that halothane, together with catecholamines, may lead to increased risk of arrhythmias. Patients with a goiter may have a difficult airway or airway obstruction, which may worsen or become catastrophic after administering neuromuscular blockade. Patients may also have substernal extension of the goiter, and at this point, we deal with the physiology of a mediastinal mass. Patients with exophthalmos may be at increased risk for corneal injury. Do hyperthyroid patients have increased MAC? There are some sources that say the answer is yes. Postoperatively, after surgery on the neck and especially on the thyroid, we should be vigilant for signs of damage to the superior or the recurrent laryngeal nerves. Damage to both recurrent laryngeal nerves will lead to a closed glottis and an inability to move air. Patients may also develop a hematoma in the neck, causing airway compromise, and hypoparathyroidism is also a known side effect. Hypothyroidism is in many ways the opposite of hyperthyroid. Patients may have decreased heart rate, blood pressure, and respiratory rate. They may experience fatigue, cold intolerance, weight gain, hair loss, and constipation. Myxedema can occur, which is swelling of the face or skin with gelatinous fluid in the interstitial spaces. In its worst, we can see myxedema coma, where patients become stuporous, hypoventilate, become hypotensive, and hyponatremic. Myxedema coma is a critical condition, and only life-saving surgery should be done in patients who are in myxedema coma, because the mortality of this condition is anywhere from 25 to 50 percent. Those patients should receive IV thyroid replacement and steroids and be kept warm. They are at increased risk for myocardial ischemia as well. There are, again, many causes of hypothyroidism. They include Hashimoto's disease, which is an autoimmune destruction of the thyroid gland, iodide deficiency, which can also lead to a goiter, and iatrogenic hypothyroidism. For example, if the patient has had a thyroidectomy or a thyroid ablation. What are the anesthesia concerns for hypothyroid patients? Well, do they need to be euthyroid? In general, we say no, unless they have very, very severe and symptomatic hypothyroidism. There aren't really any contraindicated agents in hypothyroid patients. They may have a decreased level of pseudocholinesterase, which may be a soft relative contraindication to using succinylcholine. Patients who have symptomatic hypothyroidism and critical coronary artery disease may actually benefit from cabbage prior to thyroid surgery. Hypothyroid patients probably have no alteration to their MAC. We'll stop here. Please contact me if you have any questions about the material.